I've titled my sermon today, The Love of Money. Let's look to the Lord in prayer just before we look to his word and hear it proclaimed. And let's ask for his help to understand it and for the Spirit's aid in, in applying it. Let's pray. Lord God, this is your word. We know that your word is truth and that you mean it to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our way. By the grace of your Holy Spirit, we pray that we would understand it. But more than that, we pray that our hearts would be conformed to it, that our lives would be changed by it, that we would begin to live the truth, and that we would show the truth in the way that we live. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been in 1 Timothy for a number of weeks now, haven't we? And we've seen over and over that, that Paul is interested in setting forth healthy priorities for life and ministry through the local church, and that he's not merely giving advice, although he has much wisdom and, and every right to give wise counsel and advice, but he's actually setting down the pattern and the principles for ministry and life together in the local congregation that he expects to see worked out in every Christian congregation, in every time, in every culture. Uh, and so what Paul is saying to these congregations in Asia Minor in the first century is, is really equally relevant and applicable to us today. And so now, now we're back to a passage in which Paul is speaking about false teaching. And, and last week he had a word in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 to 2, to those who were kind of in this local congregation who were slaves, uh, and they were actually in the condition of slavery. Uh, he had some words to them about what their attitude was to be in that life and some principles for us to learn from. But now he's back to false teachers again here in verses 3 through 10. And well, if you've been with us going through First Timothy, th this must be the fifth time in this book that, that Paul has spoken about false teaching. You must think it's a, a fairly significant issue to return to over and over like this. So let me just outline the passage for you so that you can follow along his train of thought. Uh, if you look at verse three, Paul says that some words that characterize sound doctrine, he wants to give you a description of what sound doctrine looks like so that you can know what sound doctrine is when you see it and then distinguish it from false doctrine when you see it. And then secondly, if you look at verse four, he speaks about the character of false teachers. So he explains two or three characteristics that are evident in the lives and in the habits of those who are false teachers. And then if again, if you look at Verses 4 and 5, he will describe for you the results of false teaching. In verse 1, we would have been told that, that sound teaching leads to godliness. Well, verses 4 to 5 show what false teaching leads to. And then fourthly, in verse 5, he'll tell you one of the key motivations for false teachers. One of the things that's going to strike you today is how contemporary Paul's words are. Paul is speaking about one of the key motivations for false teacher, teachers in his day. And well, you will not have to look too far to see the same motivation for false teachers in our day. And then fifthly, if you look at verse six, he'll contrast uh, the gain, you know, the real gain that Christian godliness brings with the false gain that the false prophets suggest. And then finally, in verses seven through 10, uh, you'll see a sixth thing, kind of a sixth principle that he sets forth, and it's really a warning. It's a warning against what he says is one of the key roots of evil in the lives of men and women. So having outlined what the direction of Paul's argument is, let's look closer at God's word together now. So here, as we've said, Paul's speaking about false teachers, but we're not off the hook. If we say, well, I'm not a teacher, so I can't be a false teacher, or, or I'm not a false teacher, even though I'm a Sunday school teacher, or I'm not a false teacher, even though I'm a minister, uh, so this passage doesn't apply to me, well, you're going to be disappointed, because this passage does apply to us. You know, Even 
as Paul gives us as Christians who sit under the teaching and preaching of God's word, or who should regularly, even as he gives us instructions about how to distinguish true teaching from false teaching, because we want to be nourished by the truth, not led astray by falsehood. And so his words are applicable to all of us in that way. Even so, as he talks about one of the great characteristics of these false teachers, he touches on a very important issue in Christian life, really our attitude towards material wealth. And what a timely and potent thing for us to be thinking about. I mean, even more broadly, the issue of really stewardship of everything that God has given to us, since he is the owner of all things and everything we've received from him. We'll look at this passage together. Paul begins by telling us what sound doctrine looks like in order that he will be able to distinguish between sound teaching and false teaching. And so we see that. We look at what he says in verse 3. If anyone advocates for a different doctrine and does not agree with with sound words, those of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, and then he'll go on to say he's conceited and he understands nothing. But notice how he describes sound doctrine. It's according to the sound words that Paul and the other apostles have been teaching. It's apostolic. It's according to Jesus' teaching. It's in strict accord with the teaching that Jesus gave. It's not some new secret teaching that no one has ever heard of. It's the same story that Jesus preached. It's the same truth that the apostles teached and preached. It's in accord with the faithful teaching of the word that the Christian church has been nourished on from the very beginning. And so notice what Paul says in verse three, it leads to what leads to godliness. It doesn't leave you filled up with information that hasn't changed your life. It transforms your life so that this truth is lived out in godliness in holiness in commitment to Christ. And so Paul points this out in order that the people of God sitting in the pews can contrast false teaching from sound teaching. So sound doctrine, Paul's saying, is it's in accordance with Jesus's teaching. It's in accordance with the apostles' teaching, and it leads to godliness. It leads to holiness. And so these false teachers, we know from books that we have studied from, from around this time and a little bit later, that they were claiming that they had revelations from God, uh, which even the apostles had not received. Jesus had communicated to them by the Holy Spirit certain truths which were key to the Christian life, key to the blessed life, which had not been revealed to the apostles, or at least some of the apostles. And so they were coming as kind of mouthpieces of the Holy Spirit to tell Christians the Christian church truths which they had never heard before. And the Apostle Paul says, I want to contrast my teaching. My teaching, by contrast, Paul says, is the old story. It's the old, old story. I have absolutely nothing new to tell you. What I have to tell you is what Jesus has to tell you. What I have to tell you is what the other apostles have to tell you because we didn't make up our teaching as we went along. We got it from the Lord Jesus Christ. We got it from the word. We preach the Bible, which is God's revelation of who he is and of his will and of his ways and the way of salvation. That's where we get our teaching from. We don't have any secret teaching to bring you. And Paul says there's a contrast. And somebody comes along and says, oh, I've got something new and secret for you. You've actually never heard it before. Uh, This is a special teaching that I alone have received, right? And it's the key to the Christian life and actually unlocking the blessings of life. You know, you can be certain in that moment you're hearing a false teacher. Because Paul is saying, my teaching's open, right? It's not some secret teaching for the 
you know, Illuminati that only special Christians have heard and can understand. No, our teaching's open. The apostles, we've all been preaching the same message. It's the only message we have, actually. And it's the message that we receive from Jesus Christ. We're preaching the old, old story. And so sound doctrine, Paul is saying, is in accord with Jesus's teaching. It's in accord with the apostles' teaching, and it leads to godliness. It doesn't lead to speculation. It doesn't lead to divisive arguments. It leads to godliness. It is productive of a life which is in accord with God's word. And so there's there's his first principle. Sound doctrine is in accord with Jesus and the apostles' teaching, and, and it leads to godliness. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to look at two or three characteristics of false teachers, and you see those things in verse 4. Notice what he says about a person who doesn't advocate for sound doctrine. He says he's conceited, he understands nothing, but has this kind of morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words. Isn't that amazing? Three things he says are characteristics of teachers. Pride, ignorance, and a preoccupation with obscure things. I mean, how many times have you seen this? I'll never forget a professor of mine in seminary looking to us, and we were talking about a very, very intelligent man who is teaching things that were untrue. And he said, brothers, all you need to be a heretic is a little intelligence and a little pride and you've got the perfect ingredient for heresy. Here, Paul's saying the same thing. He's saying those who are teachers teaching these false things, their problem is that they're conceited. They're prideful. They're puffed up. They want to have the special standing and esteem and authority and control over believers. And so they cook up their own teaching. Because they cook up their own teaching they show that they really don't understand Christianity. Though they profess to be smarter than everyone else, they really don't understand the truths of the grace of the gospel revealed in the word of God. And so furthermore, they fixate on controversial questions and disputes about these words. You remember Jesus saying to the Pharisees, one of their problems is that they would strain a gnat and swallow a camel. Well, Paul is saying that these false teachers are just like that. They'll get fixated on some tiny little truth off to the side. Uh, that's probably not even, not even a, a truth. <laughs> and they'll teach about it every time you turn around. It may be some aspect of end time teaching. It might be politics. It might be a host of things that people are fixed on. Have you ever met people like this? I mean, I have. I've met people who their first words to me weren't like, hi, my name's John. How are you? It's like, wh what do you think of the little horn of David before they've even asked my name? They're fixated on it, right? Why is it they always fixate on some small thing? All they want to talk about is this particular aspect. And Paul says that's a characteristic of a false teacher. They're prideful. They're ignorant, despite what they may claim. And they have this unhealthy interest in the obscure. And so what, what does this result in? Well, that's the third thing that Paul teaches here. We look at verse 5. What does this kind of teaching result in? Verses 4 and 5, he says, Out of which arise envy strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, constant frictions between men of depraved mind and men deprived of the truth. So in other words, false teaching will lead to personal ungodliness and to corporate division. Now let's pull back for a moment. It is true that sometimes learning the truth itself can be difficult for the people of God. They can wrestle and struggle with it. And so those of us who care greatly about the truth may be very concerned that our fundamental concern 
is that the truth would lead to transformed lives characterized by loving service of one another, real godliness, commitment to brothers and sisters, not a, a spirit of being smarter than everybody else. Right? We evangelicals, we care a lot about truth in a day that really doesn't care about truth. And that means that we're actually liable to a sense of spiritual pride. And we must guard against that. One way to guard against that is always making sure that the truth is leading us to more Christ-likeness, leading us to more godliness, leading us to more commitment in our lives to the word of God. So that being said, Paul says that, that false teaching will always lead to dissension, we see, wrangling about words, evil suspicions, strife among brothers and sisters in Christ. It won't produce godliness. It won't produce and deliver the goods. And how often have we seen this in practice, right? Where men claim to have seen a truth that nobody else understands, and they destroy Christians, and they break them apart from the church, and they divide congregations? How often have we seen this in practice? And well, Paul, Paul actually tells us right here. And now in verse 5, Paul goes on to tell us what one of the key motives of these false teachers is. And it's, it's the fourth thing that he tells us in this passage. He just comes right out and says, and tells us that these men suppose that godliness is a means of gain. And by that, he means that these men suppose that godliness is a means of material gain. They think they're going to get rich off the gospel. They're going to get rich off of Christianity. They're going to gain material wealth through the truth of Jesus Christ in the gospel. And Paul is saying that they're motivated by a desire for material wealth. Now, my friends, this could have been written yesterday. If you were to turn on television or go to the most prominent speakers and online today or really any day of the week, four out of five programs that claim to be Christian proclamation of truth are doing exactly what Paul is speaking about here. They're turning Christianity into a means of gain, and, and it's everywhere. The most common form of false teaching in churches and English-speaking world today is the false teaching that God wants you to be physically healthy and materially wealthy all the time. And if you're not, it's because you just don't have enough faith. You just need a little bit more faith, or you haven't made the commitment to this secret teaching of whoever is teaching that particular message. And it's very common here. You know, Paul's talking about it 2,000 years ago, and he's saying that these false teachers are motivated by a desire for material gain. And Paul wants to make it clear that this is not what Christianity is about. Notice what he says. This is the fifth thing that he says, and you'll see it in verse 6. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. In other words, Paul is saying, you know, yes, the gospel does in fact bring great gain, but it's not the kind of gain that the false teachers are talking about, that they're teaching about. You know, false teachers who teach the health and wealth teaching will often teach it as if it's this radical truth. It's a truth which is greater than the truth which is being preached by those gospel preachers who don't say that God is going to make you healthy and wealthy if you embrace that particular teaching of health and wealth. They'll teach it as an exercise of, of greater faith, uh, something that goes beyond the mundane experience of many people that claim to be Christians. Uh, but think about it, friends. We live in a materialistic consumer culture that values very much life based on the bottom line. You know, what the health and wealth teachers are teaching really isn't radical at all. It is totally conformed to the whims and trends and desires of this world. What's really radical is what the Apostle Paul is saying. 
because it's what Jesus was saying. The gospel does bring greater gain. It's radical, but it's not the kind of gain that the false teachers are talking about. It's the kind of gain that comes with contentment because the gospel involves believers who have become, by grace, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, taking up their cross and following and dying daily to sin and to self, living for Christ and for one another. That's why Jesus was so fascinated at the poverty-stricken woman who gave her last mite to the temple offering, right? And he says to his disciples, look at that woman. There is a model for the worship of God. She had little, and she gave everything that she had to the Lord. And why is Jesus drawing attention to that? Not to impress upon the disciples the principle that if you follow, you know, the seven secrets of health and wealth, that you're going to be some multi-billionaire, but to show the kind of gain that one gets when you follow Jesus. And so Paul makes it clear that the gospel will always foster a gain that brings with it contentment. And my friends, this world may be whispering a lot of things in your ear. It's not whispering, be content. Everything around you is actually screaming, don't be content. Or you can't be content until you have the next thing. And Paul is saying that when the gospel takes hold of you and you're able to believe in the kind and tender, the loving kindness and mercy of God, that you'll be able to rest in his provision like you've never rested before. No matter how much or how little that you have, And then he goes on to say, in verses 7 to 10, he calls us to guard our hearts against the pernicious love of money. He says, we brought nothing into this world. We cannot take anything out of it either. If we had food and covering with these, we shall be content. Josh said earlier, there's no moving trucks in heaven. I thought that's brilliant. That captures it. And my friends, no Christian is immature from an inordinate love of money. You can be poverty stricken and living in the slums of Sao Paulo, Brazil, and struggle with the love of money. When you're poverty stricken, your temptation is to want something that you don't have and to think that what you don't have will give you the satisfaction that you're looking for. Well, we have a different kind of struggle or at least many of us, all of us have this struggle. We have so much. We are both inclined to forget the one who has given us what we have, and we're inclined to enjoy the things that we've received from his gracious hand more than we enjoy him. We're tempted to view him, God, as a means to get what we really want, which are the things which we think will give us satisfaction and fulfillment. In other words, instead of loving God and using the world, we use God to get the world, which we love more than God. And that's the challenge of affluence. We are awash in the wealthiest culture in the history of the world. We are Christians in the midst of that affluent culture. And so we ourselves, we must be on guard against the pernicious love of money, all of us. Notice two things. Paul does not say that money is the root of all evil. This is not some proto-Marxist speech here. This is not a rant against capitalism. But he says the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. So when your desires are centered upon things, you know, material blessing, when that is where your satisfaction, your delight, and your security comes from, that's when we're in trouble. Because God wants us to depend upon Him. He wants us to love Him and use the world, not use Him and love the world. But Paul also doesn't say that the love of money is the root of all evil. That's actually how the King James translated this passage, and that's a perfectly good literal 
translation, but this is one of those passages where Paul clearly uses all, not to mean every last one, but kind of every category, all sorts, all kinds of evil. Paul in this very book will show several other roots of other sins. But here he's saying the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And the New Testament bears that out, doesn't it? I'm haunted by the last phrase of verse 10. Aren't you? Some by longing from it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You can think about the very thing in, in the New Testament. Ananias and Sapphira. Simon Magus, who wanted to buy the extraordinary gifts of the Holy Spirit so that he could make money. Judas, who sold our Savior for 30 pieces of silver. And even more heartbreaking than that, the rich young ruler who came to Jesus to ask him how he could have eternal life, and he went away sorrowing, we're told in the Gospels. When Jesus told him to sell everything that he had and follow him because he had many things, and his contentment, his fulfillment, his satisfaction was in those things. You think of him as wandering away from the faith. There he was standing in front of God, his God and Savior, and he left him because he had chosen to serve mammon rather than God. This is why Jesus is so concerned that we're determined to use the material blessings that God gives us. Not to worship them, not to love them, not to find our ultimate delight in them, not to find our fulfillment in them, or to find our security in them. And by the way, that's one way that stewardship to the church works. When you give for the building of God's kingdom, of Christ's kingdom, one of the things that it does is it teaches you to trust that the Lord will provide for you in that which you have given away for his work. It's a blessing to give that away and then to have to depend on the Lord, right? L Lord, you're going to have to bring in what I need. I'm committing to support your work, trusting that you will support my family's needs. Guard your hearts, Paul says, against the pernicious love of money. In this passage, Paul not only gives us words whereby we, we can detect false teaching, but, but he's actually, he searches our hearts, our own hearts, to see if we love God more than we love things. And I don't know of a greater challenge for us than that today. Many sins and temptations we grapple with, we wrestle with and against, but this is one whereby we will be measured, friends. So let's pray that God, by his spirit, would help us to love Christ, to love his kingdom, and to seek him first, and, and then to let God add all the other things. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the way that Paul knows our hearts in this passage. And he knows our hearts not simply because he knew his own heart or because he was a wise pastor, but because these words aren't ultimately Paul's words. They're your words. And you made us, and you know our hearts, you know our sins. Lord God, forgive us the ways that we have loved things and comfort more than we've loved you. And Lord, given how much you have given us, we pray that you would, by the Spirit, help us to make that count for the work of your kingdom. That even in the way that we use wealth, we would show that we worship you alone and no one else. So this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.